Well, good morning, family. Beautiful day out there. Beautiful day to be in here. Glad to be privileged to study God's Word again. We are going to continue today to cons consider the Godhead. We've been talking about the second person of the Trinity. And basing our discussion primarily from John chapter 1, we know that in the beginning there was God and the Word was with God and then 14 verses later it says, and the Word became flesh. We were considering last week, where was that Word between the beginning and when He became flesh? What was He doing? Was He doing anything? You remember why it was necessary to, to prove that he was doing something in the meantime? Think about the mindset of the people in the first century, particularly the, oh, the sophisticated, educated elite, the chief priests and the elders and all those who really think they know it all, particularly the Gnostics. It was necessary to, to prove that that word, even from the beginning, was doing something, that it was active. We concluded from many scriptures that, in fact, that pre-incarnate Jesus was, in fact, actively working, promoting, advancing, preparing, providing, bringing all things to pass, even in that pre-incarnate state. It is necessary to prove that the word is active and working and it is effect effectual because a great many people then and still today say, well, it's just so many words on a page. Particularly, it needed to be proven effectual when Jesus comes to present himself as being the word of life. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 130, I like the way it says it there. It talks about the unfolding of God's word giving light giving understanding to the simple there. That's always the contrast between the simple, those who are humble, willing to receive what the Word said, versus the sophisticated, you know, the, the elite people. It's interesting how it is said, the unfolding of the Word. You know, like a map, you know, you first get a little bit of the picture and then it continues to unfold, then you get the whole picture. And if you're willing to see it, you can see where you're going and how to get there. The unfolding, it is the unfolding of the word gives light. And again, it's this, this matter of there is a divine activity, a divine purpose, a divine work in, in that word, whether it is spoken or, or written. Because again, the, the Gnostics said the word has no power. They, they're... An, not, they're not simple, they're sophisticated, they're the elite. They're really, we should say, the self-elite. Because to them, this Jesus saying that he is the word of life, that means nothing. And you think about the Sadducees at that time. There's a, there's a whatever ilk the Jews were in all their sectarian divisions. Think about the Sadducees. They, they famously deny the work of ministering spirits, of angelic messengers. And so any talk of Jesus pre-incarnate being the angel of the Lord and bringing the message from, from God to man, that is in fact the very basis on which they will deny that Jesus is the Son of God because he presents himself as having been the angel of the Lord sent by God and that's all they need to deny him. Well, if that's who he says he is, then he surely can't be Messiah. We considered near the end of class last week from Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 11. That scripture, we know that all things were made by Jesus, and there it explains that he upholds all things. He's holding all things together. It, in the original language, can be translated that he's upholding all things in harmony in a harmony of order, in a harmony of purpose, that this related to this functions together just as he is. He's holding all that together. 
In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3, there it reaches even further back. Before he upholds all things, of course, he was involved in creating all things. And it, it speaks there, well, let me turn to it. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. Of course, that very well-known chapter about the heroes of those who remained faithful to the end. Hebrews 11 and verse 3, by faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. The word made is different than the word create. Create, you know, I can, like that pulpit, I can build a piece of furniture, I can create a piece of furniture out of wood that already exists. But this word made speaks about fashioning something from nothing. It wasn't visible from what what was, but he, fa he made it from nothing. There was no substance. There wasn't anything seen before that. This word made and the word prepared means it, it is fitted in order in precise order, with the result that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. They had no substance to them. And so, why is that so important? Again, why is that so important? Because, according to Psalm 33 and verse 9, He spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. We're going to start building a list of things that the Word is active in doing, and not only when Jesus was the Word, but when He, in fact, reveals the Word. Psalm 33 and verse 9, He spoke and it was done, He commanded and it stood fast. What's it tell us? It, two things about the Word. It is powerful and its effect is lasting. He, it stood fast. So it was powerful to make it, its effect is, is lasting. He's powerful also to command. Look in Matthew chapter 8, verses 26 and 27. First he speaks it into being, the effect of it is lasting. In Matthew 8, verse 26 and 27, he commanded the waves and they stood still. So Jesus creates then he controls what he creates. What he spoke into being before he was in the flesh. He controls the, phys the physical realm to be sure. What else does he control? Anything other than the physical? Spiritual. Spiritual. Mark 1 and verse 34. He, he spoke a word and the demons were subject to him. What else does he control then? The spiritual realm. So he creates, he controls he, the physical realm, he controls the spiritual realm. And so there's this progression. A lot of that he did while in heaven, the creation part. Then in, on earth he did the controlling part. What will he do in heaven then again? What's he do? What are we waiting for him to do from heaven even now? Right. John 5, verse 25 through 29. Again, the, I'm reminded, that, was it Bette Midler, maybe way back in the 80s, had this song that was really popular about God's just out there in a distance. Remember that? Yeah. Just out there in a the distance, kind of impersonal. Just somewhere out there. But the fact is, he's not just out there. He's real, he's relative, he's working. John 5, beginning in verse 29, or 25, 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is. As you mentioned, Dan, he's preparing for that hour. And when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, even so, he gave to the Son also to have life in himself. It doesn't mean that Jesus, that they're alive. What's it mean? 
They have the power of life from within themselves. They have the, the ability to transmit to that life to others. Because, in verse 27, he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. And do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth and those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment or of condemnation. What's the progression? First he creates, then he controls, then he controls the physical, he controls the spiritual. He controls even the transmitting of life, the life that's in himself, giving that same life to others. Then he's going to control what happens in the judgment. At the voice of who? Who's going to be calling? God's going to tell him when to call, but it's going to be Jesus. He's going to command that resurrection to take place. And what's he have to do? Just as in the creation, all he had to do is what? Arise. Come forth. So Jesus, with all authority, controls the physical realm, the spiritual realm, what is it, life itself and how to transmit that life. He's going to, to control the, the, the arising of all to come forth for the judgment. I say all that for thinking about it again at the time. Who's the primary audience he is speaking to at the time? Those very sophisticated, elitist, sectarian, Christ-denying Jews. And all of them, no matter who they are, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Gnostics, you know, all of them have this notion that they know God better than this man named Jesus does. You know, they all presume, they all argue that we know God in ways that nobody else has because, well, we are his chosen people. But what man presumes to know, what we think, the problem with that is it's derived from human thought. And in reality, what we think, if it's not from what God has said, then it really, human thought is comparatively less than nothing. I've said it many times, if we don't know God as he reveals himself to be known, we don't know anything. That's what Solomon learned in the Proverbs. The only way to have any sense at all is to know God. But to presume as they did that they know God better than anybody else, I would dare to think they probably thought they defined who God is, and they were trying to. But it's why in the gospel we come to what is some of my favorite part of Scripture. Those 26, in the Gospel of John, those 26, truly, truly, I say to you statements. Truly, truly. The, the declarations of Jesus. And then by those statements, I remember in, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 4, Paul there says, let God be found true and every man a liar. Now, in a sense, that's figurative language, but it's comparative language, comparing the greatness of God in his mind, his will, his thoughts to, to anything that man would devise. But how can it be that every man is a liar? If I'm honestly preaching and to, teaching the right word with the right attitude for the right purpose and for God's glory, and if I'm teaching book, chapter, and verse, just as it is intended to be taught. How in that way am I a liar, figuratively speaking? It's because God cannot lie, but man can. It is the difference. It's impossible for God to lie. And there's a big difference between that dividing line. There's the propensity to lie, even if you don't really want to. Well, in relation to these truly, truly statements, no man or woman can say of his or herself that this is true because of me. That's why the truly, truly statements are said that way. 
they are only true because Jesus is the Son of God. Nobody else can claim that. And by those statements being true, then comparatively speaking, every man is, is less than that. You know, I cannot say, I mean, saying that truly, truly means that Jesus is the mind, the voice, the active agent, and the fulfillment of the word. That's what he is. He's the mind, the voice, the active agent, and the fulfillment of the word. No man can say that. And anyone who would pretend to is indeed a liar. But again, John 5, verse 25, truly, truly. It's, it's only true because of the reasons that Jesus goes on to explain in that same chapter, verse 30 through 32. I can do nothing on my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone testify about myself, my testimony is not true. See, even in that case, Jesus says he would be a liar if he taught anything. Where does Jesus, from whom does his power come? Because he is one with God. Doing God's will, speaking God's word. There is another who testifies of me, and I know that the testimony which he gives about me is true. And so, anything apart from the knowledge of God is God reveals that to us. And certainly in this matter, these truly, truly statements, it's only true because Jesus is God. That's why they're said that way. What does he have to convince the people of in those days? What is seemingly everybody intent on proving untrue? That he is the Messiah. They don't want to hear that. They don't want to believe it. Yes. That is the beginning of it. When man determined, I'm going to take knowledge that I want, I'm going to take it on my own terms, I'm going to take it for myself, or I'm going to do what I want to do in the way that I want to do it, and I'm going to make God fight for it to change me. <laughs> and that, that's the reason for these truly, truly statements. It goes all the way back to the, the one who gave voice to the word before he was in the flesh. And that word which it prepares, it makes, it creates, it upholds, it sustains. You know, just as Jesus spoke the first creation into being, when this old world is burned up and destroyed, we're depending on him to speak a new creation into being, aren't we? There in John chapter 5, when he calls to all to arise and come forth to the judgment, we're trusting he's speaking a new creation into being. And so, in John 5 and verse 17, it's interesting how it's said there. John 5 and verse 17. This is while the, the Jews are persecuting Jesus. And there he said in the present tense, and also in the middle voice. We'll talk about that in a moment. John 5 verse 17. My father is working until now, now and I myself present tense, middle voice, am working. That middle voice means that two people are cooperating. They're, God is helping Jesus. Jesus is helping the Father. They're working together. Well, those kind of things, when Jesus says that, those are fighting words to the Jews, isn't it? I mean, it's this kind of talk that's going to get him killed. You know, that the Father is... Until now working and I myself and working with him. They're working as one, helping each, helping each other. 
And what aggravated them or angered them at that time is he's speaking on the Sabbath. What's Jesus saying? My father's working on the Sabbath and I'm working on the Sabbath. Well, that's enough to get him killed. And it's that kind of talk. Those two persons working together as God. And it's been that way, seen in all that Jesus is revealing from the beginning. Now, we've talked the last couple of weeks about the fact that Jesus was there all the time, working all the time. We can see other evidence of that in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10, there in, well, I like the heading that my publisher put above this section. It said, avoid Israel's mistakes. How, you do, how do you do that? First Corinthians chapter 10. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the clouds and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Paul, as he so often does, stacks these phrases and these descriptions on top of one another. It's just building... I mean, the evidence here is so thick. What's this cloud he's talking about? What's this cloud? It's the presence of God. It's that, that presence with him, knowing that the word that was heard from the cloud, that has all authority in that. It's being under authority of that word spoken. What's he talking about, this, this baptism? This isn't about water baptism here. It's about being immersed in the activity of the word. That word has been laid over them. It should cover everything that they do. They're immersed in it. It infuses everything that they do. And so it's the activity of the word. Then in another manner of speaking, the word being spiritual food and spiritual drink. And this word, this rock, was always with them. Again, it's this kind of talk that's going to get him killed, isn't it, Dan? It's always. What's he saying? This one who spoke to Moses, this one who is the rock that's been with you ever since then, speaks with the very authority of God. It's this rock talk that's going to get him killed. By, yes, sir. And it's also, if you think about it, it's the total selfishness of people. Because yeah. if you look in, in verse, uh, chapter 6 of John, in verse 15, it's after he had, this is after he had fed Yep. And it says, perceiving then that they were about to take him by force and make him king, Jesus refused. Right. And so they get so aggravated with him then that a lot of the disciples heard it and withdrew from it. Right. They said, well, we're not going to follow you no more if you're not going to do what we want, basically. And Jesus would not take the honor from men. He couldn't take the honor from he men. He came, yes, not seeking it, wouldn't have it, because his... Coming as a servant in the lowest kind of servant, even to be killed with the worst kind of death, his glory comes from God. You're not going to exalt him as king over a physical kingdom, the one who came to be head over a spiritual kingdom. But that's the kind of stuff that gets him in trouble too, isn't it? Because they don't want any part of this Jesus being a head over them. It's this kind of rock talk that's going to get him in trouble. Go all the way back then to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Just a little ways after Psalms there, Reliable. Isaiah 44. Who 
who's talking here? Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. There's two people having a conversation here. Isaiah 44, verse 6. Sorry about that. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. Who is like me? Let him proclaim and declare it. Yes, let him recount it to me in order. From the time that I established the ancient nation, and let them declare to them the things that are coming and the events that are going to take place. Do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? You are my witnesses. Is there any God beside me? Is there any other rock? What did the Lord, together in that conversation with his Redeemer, on what did they agree? There is no other God. There is no other rock. They said together, I know of none. Again, it's this divine activity from the beginning, and they're working together. The primary audience is unbelieving, self-preserving, as Dan said, selfish people. But also anyone else then or still now that could presume that I have life in myself, that I have knowledge of myself, that I am my own God, that I have light and hope in, in myself. We don't. We can't. Again, we could look to some New Testament evidence of that if we go then to Acts chapter 7. Of course, we recognize Acts chapter 7 as being that where Stephen is making his defense, a defense for his faith even as men are set to stone him to death. And stoning they do. Acts chapter 7, verse 35 and following. I should mention this comes right after a reference back to that time at Mount Sinai when Moses there was in the presence of the flame of the burning bush. That's part of Stephen's defense leading up to what he says in Acts 7, verse 35. This Moses whom they disowned, same old problem, isn't it? The one who speaks as with authority, speaks in the shadow of that cloud of God. This Moses whom they disowned, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? is the one whom God sent to be both a ruler and a deliverer with the help of the angel who appeared to him in the thorn bush. Pretty neat, isn't it? This man led them out performing wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. This is the one who was in the congregation in the wilderness together with the angel who was speaking to him on Mount Sinai and who was with our fathers and he received living oracles to pass on to you. There are so many things in that short passage that <laughs> would cause people at that time to deny Jesus. So many things. But there in Stephen's situation, his defense is before the, the, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And the Sadducees, again, are those who would deny the work, the voice of any angel doing anything. In this situation, among the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees really have the, the prevailing, the overruling vote. I guess it's sort of like our Senate and House of Representatives. You know, that sin is just a little bit more selective than the house. And so in the same way, no matter what anyone else says, when it gets right down to it, it's what the Sadducees say. And in Acts 7 there, in verse 38, there's that angel. This is the one 
who spoke to Moses, the father and the fathers, and to the whole congregation. And what did he speak in verse 40 or 38? Living oracles. Living oracles. The purpose is not just a bunch of laws, not just a bunch of rules. By the words that this angel spoke, there is the means to have life. Living oracles by which you would have hope. Pass those things on to you. That's what, that's why what Stephen is defending even in his being stoned to death. Living oracles. But in verse 39 there, the fathers, it says they repudiated Moses. They also repudiated the, the angel who spoke to him in that flame. They repudiated the angel when he spoke in, back in Exodus 3 in that burning bush. Who was there speaking in that bush? God, the angel of God. You remember the scene, Moses comes there, and that's that bush that's burning, but it's never going to go out. It's going to continually burn. That angel in that bush, the word was active there. What did the word say to Moses, in a sense? Back off, man. <laughs> you, you back off. Take off your sandals. Humble yourself. You're dependent on this word coming from this angel. Just as though you were be in the presence of the shadow of that cloud. Do you have something? Oh, okay. But th the point is, this is the one. There in the wilderness was the Father, the, the Logos, and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus pre-incarnate speaking from that bush. What's the problem? Whether it was back then or in the days when Christ is living as a man, what was everybody doing? by and large, repudiating. They repudiated Moses, they repudiated the prophets, they repudiated the apostles, who didn't? They repudiated, of course, just means it equals rebellion. It equals rebellion. And it's that reason for which a whole generation died in the wilderness rather than to have life in the promised land. He was giving them living oracles by which they could have life, enjoying all the promises of God. And Stephen says, this is the one. Who is this one? In chapter 7, verse 56. Behold. I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And what was their response as soon as he said that? They cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. Stoned him to death. You know, it's that same kind of talk. Jesus and the word that he brought, the angel's message, Stephen's message. This is the one, the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Again, as we've been talking about it in this sense, he was there all the time. All the time. And so he's there also, again, back in the Old Testament in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 32. Jeremiah 31 A couple of big books right after the Psalms, Lyle. Okay. Jeremiah 31 and following. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke. Isn't it interesting, people always say God ought not judge those people. 
But there's, <laughs> hey, it's my covenant. They agreed to it, but they broke it. Why are you blaming God? But my covenant which they broke, although I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and on their heart I will write it. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Something's changing here. Who is the I in verse 32? Who is the, the me? That new covenant situation in the future is, is part of the words past working. That messenger of the new covenant has to be Jesus. Of course it is. And Jesus comes to put it into our hearts. And what's he bringing when he comes? Perfect justice. And it's so... But at that time when he brings this covenant, what's the, what's the response to it, even as they responded to Stephen? They're not going to like the new covenant any more like, than they like the old one, did they? But what's it tell us? It's not a problem with the word. It's a problem with their hearts. Still the activity of the word spoken by many prophets at many times. I'll rind this up pretty quick. I mean, are we not still in this figurative sense that was described as we read earlier, still under the shadow of a cloud, under the authority of that cloud, the word immersed in the word, such that it should control everything, every aspect of our lives? That aspect of the word being spoken through many prophets, Peter speaks of that in 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter chapter 1. I always find that by the PJs. <laughs> uh, Jill was teaching some of the kids how to, to remember the order of the books, and I learned it that way. When you get to the PJs, the two Peters and the three Johns, just putting on your PJs at night. But uh, 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. You were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which war against... First Peter? Well, well then I wrote down the wrong reference. Yet. Nope. Oh, I, no, I meant Second Peter. Okay. Second Peter. Excuse me. Thank you. See, I was talking about PJs and I got the wrong P. <laughs> oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. In this way, the entrance into Christ, the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied. It's all these things that were told beforehand by the prophets and all those things that have, were prepared and activated and established through Jesus. What's, what's the problem? You know, all these times it talks about what's coming. You look forward to the judgment that's coming and if you're prepared for it in John chapter 5 and all of that. What, what's people, what does everybody want to know? Well, when is it? When's it coming? What's the mindset of you know, the people that you're describing, Dean? What's the mindset of those people? Well, if this is really what's coming, just tell me when. Because I'm not going to worry about it till then. I'm going to go ahead and do what I want to do for as long as I think I can do it. And then I'll get ready. 
just, just, just tell me when. When's it going to happen? You know, it, it, you know, people just just give me the sign. Matthew 24 and verse 3. Tell us when these things will be, at what time, by what sign. Then I'll worry about it then. You know, this instruction of Peter to, to be all the more diligent and, and to see these things through. He's not the first one to say that. Jesus said the same back in Matthew 28. Yes. to have helped somebody else, you know, to strengthen somebody else by your strength. So this phrase, be all the more diligent. Yeah. Pray more, you know, to forgive your own sins by asking him, you know, when it gets so close, then all of a sudden you realize, I may not go to heaven because I could have done a lot more. And yet you will because you're yet trusting in the blood of Jesus, aren't you? Trusting, trusting in the, that sacrifice. But that Paul told the Christians that Thessalonica excels still more. I mean, they were doing good. They were loving. And he said, excel still more. And that's got to be our attitude that how to excel still more because we live with him and we're frail and weak. And God did that. That's why he gave us that provision that God, the blood of Jesus covers us as we're walking in the light. And that's a great, great comfort. Back in Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus said, there again, like Peter, he's teaching them to observe all the things revealed to them and written. And who is it that revealed all these things? According to Paul's two letters to Timothy, it's revealed in the flesh when Jesus came to reveal it. In other words, throughout, from before the beginning to, to the time when Christ lived on earth to right now and all the way to the judgment and beyond, what do we, we have all that we need, don't we? He supplied, he called into being, he, everything that we need, he's controlling all that we need, providing all that we need, a word by which we can live, the blood by which we have our hope, we have all things necessary to observe and to practice helping us to act faithfully and act morally. And not to be like those people who who we read about who repudiated Moses, they repudiated Jesus, they repudiated any standard of authority set over them. We must be. Those times are valuable to you, aren't they? When you, same things come into focus like that, they cause you to, to re-examine. Isn't that what the scripture's trying to get us to do? We have all that we need. Jesus was there all the time, actively working, still sustaining. Looks like you're thinking about something good, Dan. What's on your mind? <laughs> Yep. And and that is the the force in all those truly truly statements. They are true because it's what he received from the Father. It's what he's passing on. It's what is true because he is himself God. And you know, the nature of God is not this mean, gnarly, vengeful thing that some people see. He is a loving God who truly, truly desires in his will that all men can't come back to him. That is what he wills. But it's up to man whether he can be forgiven. But he wants all men to repent. 
it's some of my favorite teaching in the Bible. I kind of geek out on the truly trulys. <laughs> it is so powerful because it's true because he is God. And it's true because it's effective, effective, effective to bring us into a relationship with God. Certainly the word is active through all the times. 